With the age restrictions due to experience? Hmm? With the age restrictions on promotion due to experience? No, I, th I think the, the army was fairly structured in sort of age, you know, the, the general thought was you got to sort of be a captain at about 25 and a major at about 32 and a colonel at 37. And if you weren't a, by 42 a full colonel, you, you could reckon you weren't going any further. I mean, I'm not, I'm, these are just ideas of mine, but this is about what it was. Mm. Do you not agree about that? Yeah. Yes. Well, that's true today. Isn't it? Is it? Yeah. yeah. You get into a zone where you're looking for promotion. If you don't get the promotion, you can reckon you're passed over. What were your duties as company commander, and how did you get to that position? Well, by service, really. I mean, I, I became second in command of my company, um, and then you have three platoon commanders, second lieutenants, and, and second in command, and the company commander. And you do the administrative side. I had one very difficult company commander who went off to become a judge in the, in the in Far East somewhere, in one of those island dependencies of ours. And um, he used to... I think he used to think that if he thought something, you would also think it. And I'd, he'd, he'd say, bring the food out at, at noon. But he didn't tell you where. So he sort of must have thought, well, he'll know I'll be about there. But he didn't say where. So when we got the food out, we'd have to sort of search for him in the area. But you're not permitted to ask. Well, I did, of course. But he always sort of said, well, why, you, know, you know where I shall be. I didn't know where he was going to be. But um, anyway, that was, he was a funny chap. He was, he was, he was nice, nice enough, but he was uh, difficult. Difficult to follow, because as he didn't give full instructions. Mm -hmm. and but that's the second in command's job, to sort of bring up the supplies and take over from the, the company commander if he gets knocked out. That's the sort of thing. And then I, I got promoted, and um, th that, that promotion meant a company commander, so I became the company commander. And then after that, when I'd, my, uh, the more senior major in the, of, of the majors had retired, um, I was the senior major, and I became second in command of the company. How, so was it. How did you balance your time between business and being in charge of the company? Well, it's you know that's difficult to say really. I wasn't. I was very much uh, climbing the ladder in my work. Um, uh, I, I was sort of just. I just became a director when I became uh, a major. So I became company commander and a director of my company just up the road in Mincing Lane same time. I was about 30. And um, I was able to do it because my, my work was very much nine to five. It wasn't a sort of flowing over. It was, I was, uh, we were uh, doing food business in Mincing Lane and, and, and commodity broking and so on. And so it, it sort of stopped at five o'clock. It's not like now where things go on all year, all, all the 24 hours a day because of world trade. We didn't have communications. It was lovely. Send a letter to Australia. You didn't get a reply for about two weeks. It gave you a chance to think. Then we got, we used to send coded cables. There were these great new books called ACME codes and they would start A C B. A E, and that meant there was a translation of that meant and it said, "Let me have your best offer for reply by Monday next week." You see, that was the, what it said there. So all you'd say was "at bibio," and that was the question you were asking. So you'd send a cable out with about ten groups of letters, and when they translated it all, it was like a book. Quite clever. Quite clever. And, um, but but th th that was speedier, and faxes then came in, and they, that was speedier still. But, you know, it, it got, got to a point where you, you don't have a time to think. Like now, you sit down and blast the computer, strike that out. Um, 
the computer and you know you're so sending I do two things um, send a message and the wretched chap at the other end is watching and before you've switched off he's given you a reply it's no good at all you've got no time to think what made you eventually leave the TA? Mr Wilson the Prime Minister he axed the TA and it became the TABR Territorial Army Volunteer Reserve and the battalion became a company a company uh, which was a full strength 130 men with a major a captain and three subalterns and the man who took it over was um, uh, one of my colleagues he was one of my company commanders when I was the second in command and um, I saw him at the Guild Hall about a month ago, and he's a retired Lord Mayor. Um, I understand that you're involved with the Royal Fusiliers Association mm -hmm. and the Tower Ward Club. Can you explain yeah. your roles with these? The Tower Ward Club, I'm, I don't really have much to do with. I'm a member and I attend meetings and things, but it is uh, one of the areas of, of London, the wards from which aldermen are selected and become alderman in the city at Guildhall um, I, I really am just a member there and I don't really, I, I haven't taken part in any function, I'm just a paid up member and I go to annual meetings and I've been to the odd social event they have the, the association I joined some, I can't remember when um, here, I joined the City of London branch um, which was situated here and I became a member and I was on the committee of that and I didn't do much I attended meetings and you know, supported things and I went on the occasional pil pilgrimage to France and then um, I did quite a lot of that and then ten, about ten years ago the chairman of the area, uh, a quite a distinguished soldier of ours called uh, Michael Gibson Horrocks, said he'd done it for ten years and it was enough, and, you know, asked me if I'd do it. And I thought, well, you know, somebody's got to do it. And, but I don't find it over-onerous because, again, um, the chairman is a sort of coordinator. I don't sort of run it. We've got we've got the chairman of the branch here, the City of London branch. We've got the chairman of the first battalion branch. We had the chairman of the second battalion branch. We've merged that with the city. And we've got a branch in Colchester and another one in Folkestone, Hythe. And the, the Folkestone one comes under the auspices of the first battalion. And Colchester is fairly independent. So really we've got two branches with two out stations. And um, they've got presidents and chairman. And I just attend meetings of the other chairman in, in Northumberland and Warwickshire and Lancashire for a coordinated um, action of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers Association. So I don't, I don't sort of run it day to day. I'm in touch, and I'm, I'm going on two pilgrimages. I went to Alguera last year, which was the 200th anniversary of the battle, which is very interesting. And I'm going to Mondemont this year, which is the first battle of the Marne. This was when the, the French and the British stopped retreating at the start of the First World War, in case you don't know this. Yeah. And uh, we, they stopped on the Marne and attacked the Germans who'd come down, and the Germans went back a bit and started digging the trenches, and that's when the trench warfare started. And the French have a big memorial at Mondemont. It's a great big fat obelisk of sort of reddish stone carved it's as, almost as tall as Nelson's column, but it's a great big chunk, of it. and it's on a hillside. And they have a big ceremony there, and they they invited Michael Gibson Horrocks 
and the Fusilier Association. And we've continued. And we're the only British representatives at this thing. So it's quite important that we, we support it. And I'm going on that in September. And then every year we have another ceremony in the Somme at High Wood because some of my colleagues rebuilt the memorial there to the London Division who got rather shot up at High Wood. And um, it's a beautiful memorial. And we go there. It's between two, two villages. One is Martin Bush, as the boys call it. It's Matin Puy, but they call it Martin Bush, until I told them how to pronounce it. And then I say that jokingly because they, they now say it like that. They say Martin Puy. And, and Longueval. And the, the high woods in the middle. And we go and uh, lay a wreath in Martin Puy and then we do it at High Wood, and then we go on to Longval, and they give us a, a vin d'honneur, a glass of wine and a piece of cake in the, in the sort of town hall or the school or wherever. And that's a very nice weekend. But it's lovely country, and why I like the Somme is you wouldn't believe that it was the scene of a battle, but it's exactly as it was. It's the, the, the buildings that have gone up are in the villages where they were. And the villages aren't much bigger than they were. They're a bit more modern because, of course, they were totally destroyed. But all the hills and the valleys and the woods and high wood, which was knocked down to that high off the ground, wasn't a stump taller than that. Huge acres of wood that high. It's now a great big bushy wood again and there's a manor house in it. And the rest is closed. Nobody goes in it because it's, it's thought of as a war grave. It's so much still in there, unexploded and so on. And, um, but you, you stand there. I've been there on July the, the 1st, the date of the battle. And but it was just 60 years later or earlier. But it's all the same. The wheat was in the same conditions and the, the sun was shining and all these. And that's when the slaughter took place. And, but it's all recovered now and nature's taken over. But it's the same. There are no highways going through it, no uh, pylons, no nothing. It's just the same old undulating farmlands and woods and things. It's eerie. But it's lovely. It's rather, rather moving to be there, and you think this is the country as they saw it on that day, not what it became. You know, dreadful, ploughed-up slaughterhouse. So I go there. Why was it important for you to get involved with the association? It wasn't important. Uh, it, it's only important personally, you know, if you yeah. feel you're interested in um, continuing it. I'm, I'm rather a traditionalist and, and the Royal Fusiliers was formed in, in 1675, that's right. And that's a long time ago. The, you know, the, the, the new regiment, the RRF, which is a combination, I mean the, 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 the Northumberland Fusiliers are even older than they call, they're the fifth, aren't they? Yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and the Lancashire Fusiliers and the Warwickshire Fusiliers, you know, all quite old, but this 1675, it's a long time. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, that's why I like it, and that's why I like, um, you know, the city and the pageantry and the Lord Mayor and all the things that go with it. That, you know, draw people to London, really, a lot of these things. Can't, you can't cost them. You know, it's, it's, and the thing that is, often forgotten, particularly by our politicians, is tradition. You, you, once, once you cut it, it's, it's dead. You cannot revive tradition because it stops. The, 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 the ceremony of the keys here has taken place for 800 years or whatever, and it's never not been going on. It stopped once in the war. It was late once in the war when the, the yeoman warders and the and the guardsmen were blown over by a bomb blast. But the first man on his feet was the yeoman warder, who said, he is alleged to have said, escort to the keys, on your feet. And the guardsmen 
climbed to their feet and they marched on, they were three minutes late. Otherwise it's been on time forever. And you stop it, that's it, finished, the tradition's gone. You can't restart a tradition. And that's why I'm, 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 I still support the World Food Association. Because my, my lot, are, so the older ones, the RRF are, are, are newer after my time in, a, in a, they're still now We're all the same thing, but all the chaps in the City of London branch are pretty well old hands. Second, first battalion are younger. But um, you know, that's why we merged the second battalion, because the second battalion was, was disbanded in 1948. So the, 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 the surviving fellas from that, when we merged, had to be about sort of 85 or 86. So we, we scooped in those fellas into our thing, and they still turn up. What are the main changes you've observed during your time with the Fusiliers? Um, well, I, I, I can't really say. I mean, with my time as a, as the Fusiliers Association, or when I was in the TA, the TA was the same. It was the, the first battalion and the, the TA battalion and the reservists and the associations, which I didn't have much to do with while I was in the, in the TA. After the disbandment of the, of the TA, um, the new regiment was formed at that time, so I wasn't really associated with it. They were merging and forming the three battalions we had, um, a few slayers. And um, I... I you know, I c couldn't compare them because it was a, a new concept that I wasn't really with. By then I'd left the army part and I was association, so the, the merging went on sort of outside my view. Within your time in the TA, then, did you observe any changes there? Oh, yes. I mean, when we, when we lost the National Service men... Uh, it, it was it was good. I mean, it didn't. It was quite good when we had the national service, but it was better probably when we didn't, because they were all volunteers and they were they were there because they wanted to be. And and it was quite a, you know, it was a club really, and the, the boys used to gather and they used to drill hall at Ballam as their social club. You know, they were drinking on a Sunday, not nothing to do with them. Um, TA, they would be there with their wives and things on a Sunday and they'd have parties and dances and all sorts of things going on. So it's very much a, a social thing as well as being military. And it's, it's really what kept it going, you know. So it was the, the, the ethos was of, of service was there and they did it because they liked it and they enjoyed the social life. And, and when we go on these pilgrimages, a lot of the wives come with us. They're not, you know, these... And we're all old men and old ladies now, and they they all come. They don't all come, but there's a fair preponderance of ladies come on it. Well, thank you very much. Is there anything else? Yeah, I think that's the end of our questions. Yeah. So, okay. that's, I hope I've answered anything, not yeah, verbal on. Fantastic. Thank fantastic. you very much. Really? Thank you. Oh, yeah. good. Good.